right, y'all. Two-minute warning is up. It's game time. I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump in. We got a lot of ground to cover today. What's up, Michael? How are you, man? Michael's getting baptized Sunday, y'all. Right on, yeah? If you're ready to take that step, you should join him. Be a good day. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this night, for these people, for your love and your provision for us, and um, just for all the truth that we're about to experience. Would you open our hearts and our minds and help us to see things clearly? Help me to teach clearly and plainly so that we see you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, question. How many of you did your homework? Really? It's going to make my job so much easier. Kevin was like, nope, not me. We're going to have time in just a second. We'll kind of catch you up. Let me do some review because I want to remind everybody that was here where we've been. And if you haven't, if you weren't here last week, this can kind of bring you back up because we're, we have to build a foundation of knowledge before we look at all these feasts. Did you all just put your two tables together? I worked really hard to stagger those tables. What's the deal? You big giant. <laughs> Quit bossing me around, bosser. Here's some review. We need to learn three Hebrew words, ot, moedim, and mikra. Ot is signs, markers, and beacons. And we're going to see that in Scripture in just a second. Moedim is appointed times, set times, fixed times. And then mikra, an assembly or gathering at an appointed time, a rehearsal. That's the big word you have to remember. A rehearsal for something in the future. So when we're talking about these festivals, all three of those words are used to describe them. Ought, they are signs, they are beacons, they are things you are to be looking for. Uh, Moedim, they have a very specific time on the calendar and on a clock that you are to celebrate these things, very specific. And there's a reason for that we're going to see tonight. And then Mikra, not only are they signs and specific times, but they are, you're to be looking forward. It's like a dress rehearsal for the real thing, okay? So anytime you see those words, festival, feasts in the Old Testament, remember those three words. They're a sign at an appointed time, and they're a rehearsal. You with me? All right, awesome. Would you consider the mikra then, what we're doing tonight? De de define. Like, you know, we're, this is an assembly for a gathered time to focus on the future. I mean, could this be considered a mikra? No, I don't think so, because a mikra is uh, a, a rehearsal for something very specific. Some, you'll see that here tonight. I think you'll see at the end of this why I say no. Second review. Uh, the first and most important, uh, important appointed time was a weekly celebration called? Sabbath. Sabbath. Remember that? We talked about this last week. Um, let's just read Leviticus 23 real quick. The Lord spoke again to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel, say to them, the Lord's appointed times, there's the Moedim, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, there's Mikra. My appointed times are these. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is, there is a Sabbath of complete rest, a holy convocation, a dress rehearsal for something coming. You shall not do any work. It's a Sabbath to the Lord, a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. And then Isaiah, the prophet, he later said, talking about what the dress rehearsal is preparing us for. As the new heavens and the new earth uh, I, that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your name and your descendants will endure from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me. We will celebrate Sabbath in heaven one day, the new heaven and the new earth. And I was thinking about your question about Sabbath. And I want to... I wanna, as concisely as possible, give you two reasons why God gave us Sabbath. One, I think this is critical so that you don't get your identity from what you do. If you pour your life into your job and it's a seven-day-a-week thing, you begin to define who you are by what you do. That's a totally an American thing, isn't it? Um, if I ask you, uh, what do you do? Your first response is, I'm an administrator, I'm a pastor, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist. No, that's what I do, right? But what I am is something different. My identity needs to come not from my job, but from my relationship with my creator, right? 
So one of the reasons God gave us Sabbath was so that we could remember, I am more than what I do. The second is he wanted to give us a specific, consistent day of the week to focus on worshiping him. The Sabbath is not just for rest, it is for the Lord. It is set aside to worship the Lord. And this is something we've got to remember as Jesus followers is we need a specific, consistent day when we are putting aside all other focus and focusing on God. Make sense? All right, moving on. More review. <clears throat> there are seven holy days. By the way, our word holiday comes from those two words, holy days. So when Christians get all upset about somebody saying happy holidays, maybe we shouldn't because what they're saying is, whether they know it or not, happy holy days. Just my little two cents worth. There are seven holy days or festivals designed, ordained, and set in place on the Hebrew calendar by God. Every culture on this planet has days of celebration. The ancient cultures all have days of celebration centered around agriculture, planting, seasons changing. And we're going to see in just a second, these have that same element, these Hebrew ones do. And there's a good argument to be made by a lot of scholars that all the other ancient holidays that are agriculturally based have their roots in the ones we're about to look at, which I think is pretty cool. Um, this is not a slide, but I want to remind you, I'm not telling you you should celebrate these seven holidays. Don't, don't hear me say that. I am not saying that you need to start celebrating these seven holidays. I am saying that these holidays were important to Jesus. And if you're a Jesus follower, if it's important to Jesus, it needs to be important to you. Okay? So if Jesus spent 33 years of his life celebrating these every year of his life, at the very least, we as his followers who are not Jewish people, I'm not asking you to convert to Judaism, that would be a bad idea, but we who follow Jesus need to understand why he celebrated those things. So if it was important to him, it should be important to us, and at the very least, we should understand why he celebrated those. So that's why we're looking at these. Let's look at the four spring festivals. <clears throat> Excuse me, as a review. Should be the next slide, Terry. Thank you so much. We have Passover, we have unleavened bread, we have first fruits, and we have Pentecost. Those first three are all boom, boom, boom on the calendar, and then 50 days later is Pentecost. And then there's fall festivals. There's the Jewish New Year or the Feast of Trumpets. There's Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. And there's Sukkot, which is tabernacles or booths. Y'all with me? You can, it's fun to say Sukkot because it sounds like you're insulting somebody. Just... It's fun. I also like to read the King James Version of the Bible so I can use the King James Version of the word for donkey, which is, say it, Matthew. How dare you? That's rude. <laughs> Next review. Gosh, so sidetracked. Okay, each appointed festival, each one of these seven things in the Old Testament has three elements, and we're going to look at all three tonight of Passover. There's an agricultural element, there's a historic element, and there's a prophetic element. So for 1,500, 3,500 years now, Jewish people have been celebrating these seven festivals, and there's three components, planting or harvesting, history, something to remember, and prophecy, something to look forward to, okay? So tonight we are going to look at I think the most important one, uh, Passover or Peshach, and it's really in the Bible, you'll note that it's called Passover season, because Passover season is an eight-day long celebration with three really big festivals in the middle of these eight days. There's Passover, there's unleavened bread, and there's first fruits. Passover and unleavened bread are two of the three that the Bible requires all Jewish men to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. Okay, like don't do it at home, come to Jerusalem. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 16. The Bible says you may not observe the Passover in just any of the towns that the Lord your God is giving you. You must celebrate it only at the designated place of worship, which will eventually be the temple. They didn't know that at this time. 
It's the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Observe it there in the evening as the sun goes down on the anniversary of your exodus from Egypt. Very specific instructions, but it gets more specific. If you read Exodus 12, you know, really specific. So let's look at the agricultural element. It's really simple. It's pretty quick. <clears throat> this was the beginning of Israel's barley harvest. They were harvesting wheat, grain. And this grain would be the grain that the country would use all year long to make bread. So they were literally starting the process of getting everything they needed to feed their people. The most common thing everybody ate, it was the staple of their diet, was barley bread. So this was the season when they would start to harvest it. Um, the historic element is Exodus chapter 12. If you've read that, it starts with some instructions, right? And then it kind of tells you what happened, why we're doing these instructions. So has, has somebody at every table read Exodus 12 before tonight? All right, perfect. So here's your first discussion question. That's all the review. Now we're going to jump in head first. Why do you think that God ordained the events of Exodus 12 as the first and most important feast on the calendar? Exodus 12 starts by saying, um, this is going to be the first of the year for you. This is the first month for you. This is the first celebration of the year for you. In Hebrew thinking, first thing is always most important thing. So this is the most important thing the Hebrew people would celebrate up to today. Why? Talk at your table. Why do you think God put those events to be the most important thing? Why is Exodus 12 and those events the one important thing God's people are supposed to remember and celebrate and observe? All right, y'all good? Let me, hear, let me hear from your table. What would y'all say? Why, why do you think God made this the first and most important celebration? So that they would remember how he rescued them, what, what he took them out of. What did he take them out of? Slavery, captivity, good words. Anything else, your table? Rita did? Rita says lots of things that are good. Rita's a smart lady. What did Rita say? If this was a rehearsal, they should have been looking forward, not just back. What did you guys say over there? Same thing? You guys? saying, okay, I'm going to do this and I will deliver. Hmm. Um, you know, I use this analogy a lot. Don't ask me why. This comes from my brain. So it's both <laughs> a lot of times I feel like Christians are like, or Jesus followers, are kind of like Star Trek. You know, we have the, the half human and the half Vulcan. Star Trek, you know what I'm talking about. You know, we You're so old, Mike. <laughs> What's that? You're so old. <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, it's just like each day we have our, I'm not saying that, 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 that we have the fight of our lives every day, but, you know, we have our spiritual side, which we definitely need to think about, which we need to focus on all the time, but then we have the human side of us that says, okay, you know, the new heaven and the new earth is great, but... You know, you still got to pay your mortgage, <coughs> you still got to pay your, make your car yeah. payment and, and do all that, you know. Yeah. So. We're actually going to talk about that Sunday, that you are, as a creation of God, you are a body, and you're a mind, and you're a spirit. And all those three things somehow have to work together, and God wants to make all those things new. No, not at all, not at all. <laughs> What'd you guys say? 
Why is this the most important one? Same things? Okay. How about you guys? Elongated table. What would y'all say? <laughs> Eric? Same things? Okay. Okay. That was part of it, right? When your children ask, you're going to be able to tell them for generation to generation. I would add one thing that maybe you guys missed. So in the specific instructions, they were to slaughter this lamb and then take the blood and smear the blood on the doorposts and the top of the door, right? And then they were supposed to walk under the blood and stay in the house all night, right? Because who was coming? The angel of death. A, A lot of people think that God came and killed all the firstborn. The Bible says an angel of death came. The, the Hebrew thinking is that they, by placing blood on their house, were inviting God to stand at the door and protect them from death. So Passover was not just a remembrance. It was not just a harvest celebration. It was a time when they were to remind themselves that only God could protect them from death. That's important as we look forward. It's important as part of the rehearsal, right? Isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't he free us from death? The whole, the whole thing was a celebration of freedom from slavery, and Jesus took it another step and freed us from death. So um, one more question for you. Maybe this one, I'm really interested to hear your responses. How do the events and elements of Exodus 12 apply to us Gentiles in 2024 in Artesia? What are the applications that we should take from Exodus 12? Elongated table, y'all are first. What, what should we apply? What are the applications? I know there's a bunch. Give me a couple. Matt, you were, you were saying one that I really liked. Yes. Good. How about y'all? <laughs> Any applications? Did you? Well, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. But, um, I don't know. It talked about in the beginning of the first month, and um, I don't know, it reminded me of giving your first fruits to God and kind of how we should be living our lives. And then it talked about um, basically being covered by the blood of Jesus. That's a big application for us, right? That's good. You guys? Cicely, you were saying something. I kind of caught the end of it. Can you, what were you saying? Yeah. Hmm. Why they're sacred? Yes. And so I think in Exodus 12, it kind of makes a point to say, Look, I brought you out of Egypt, I'm the Lord, this is what I gave you. That's good. You guys? Nothing? Nothing. <laughs> you guys? Not lame. Difficult. Any other applications? slaves to, you know, our jobs, to our electronics, and 
yet, you know, we need to be, and again, this goes back to the half human, half spiritual part that I talked about earlier. We need to be thinking, you know, about what waits for us in the next life. I don't yep. to say the next life. It sounds like we're all going to be reincarnated. No, I hear what you're saying. Coming back to something. As long as God has brisket and bacon, I'm fine. We won't have bacon. No bacon? Mm -mm. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Oh, shit. <laughs> Turkey bacon, maybe. Um, but, but you know, we, you know, we need to keep, we need to keep looking forward. That's it. Yeah. I, I want to suggest. Go ahead. I have a question in your okay. Let me suggest two applications that I, I don't think we saw, but I think they're important to see. Um, did you catch whose job it was to slaughter the lamb and then to smear the blood? Who? The man the man of the house. And then the whole thing was centered around the people that lived in the house, who lives in the house. You, you said the word children. It's family. This whole thing is family. God, God wanted to make sure that you learned these lessons from your family, not from Joe Bob at the synagogue, not from reading the paper down you know, putting a quarter in the machine and getting a paper. God wanted his people to learn these lessons from the family unit with dad as the leader. Is that significant? Yeah. I think that's huge. Question? Learning this and reading this over the course of my days, I don't, I still don't understand the other side. Of it. Why, what are they protecting from and why? I mean, why was their death that? Good question. So the reason they had to be protected from death is this was the last of the 10 plagues that God was sending to the people in Egypt. God, through Moses, had told the Pharaoh, let my people go. You've seen the movie. So you know the song. Get, let my people go. But Pharaoh said no. And so he sent all these plagues. And finally, Moses said, oh, okay, let's go. And then he relented. And God's like, okay, we're going to teach these people a lesson, not just the Egyptians, but my people are going to learn a powerful lesson. And he's, he said to Moses, tell Pharaoh that I'm going to come, uh, I'm going to send the angel of death to your people and I will kill all the firstborn. This is your punishment. This is your last warning. I'm going to kill all the firstborn of everybody in the land. What happens to those people? They died. No, I get that, but eternally. <laughs> they go to hell. Because of a, one man's actions. Yeah. There was no atonement for them. Yep. Oops, I forgot. It's rough. We can come back to that. We can, we can talk some more about that. No, no, no. That's good. Let's, 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 I want to drill down because I want us to see the most important thing we can see in the feasts and the festivals is Jesus. Okay? I think you're going to see if you stick with these classes over the next four, uh, five weeks, I think you're going to see that all of the seven feasts were rehearsals for Jesus, something that Jesus did. And this one is the big one. So I want us to focus on four specific instructions that God gave the Hebrews. And his instructions were, these are your instructions from generation to generation forever. These are the four things you have to do to celebrate Passover eternally. Four things. Select an unblemished lamb. Select that lamb on a specific date. Did you catch that? The 10th day of the month, the 10th of Nisan, not the car, but the Hebrew month, the 10th day of Nisan. Observe and test that lamb for five days. So have your eye on a lamb, select a lamb, test the lamb for five days. At the end of the five days, before the sun goes down, kill the lamb. And specifically, the way this timed out, the, the family lamb would be prepared at 9 a.m. on this last day. It would be killed at 3 p.m. so that you would have time to cook the lamb and eat it before 6 p.m., which was the next day. Um, the Hebrew time counting system is different than ours. A new day starts when the sun goes down, not at midnight, okay? So a new day starts around twilight. That's why the instructions. Twilight, new day. Um, 
So remember these four things as we look at the life of Jesus at the end, okay? Here's the prophetic elements of Passover. Prophetic element. I think there's just one. Before Jesus ever appeared, Jews had celebrated Passover before Jesus for 1,500 years. Generation after generation after generation for 1,500 years. And part of the celebration was supposed to be, this is a dress rehearsal for something that's coming. Look for what's coming, which was your point. Look for what's coming. These, these festivals all pointed to something to come. They were rehearsals. So Jesus, in my mind, fulfills these prophetic specifics. Number one, select an unblemished lamb. Where was Jesus born? Where? Bethlehem, <clears throat> right? You with me? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, according to the Gospels. In the first century, when Jesus was born, Bethlehem was known for two things. The first thing was bread. It, the name Bethlehem is three is two words, bet, B-E-T-H, which means house, and lechem, which means bread. So Bethlehem was the house of bread. Bethlehem and the surrounding fields were like the bread basket of Israel. They grew a ton of grain there. They provided a lot of bread for all of the people. Jesus called himself the bread of life. Coincidence? Probably not. Also in the first century, Bethlehem was known for a second thing. Bethlehem was known as the place, the best place to buy your Passover lamb. They raised blemish-free lambs in Bethlehem for generations. In fact, not only were you as a family supposed to celebrate Passover, but symbolically the high priest would celebrate Passover on behalf of everybody. <clears throat> and the high priest always bought his lamb for the sacrifice, the symbolic sacrifice in Bethlehem. You could literally say that the lambs born in Bethlehem were born to be sacrificed. Coincidence? I don't think so. So John 1.29, we are to select an unblemished lamb. John the Baptist in John 29, declared publicly that Jesus was that lamb. This was the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and John said of Jesus, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Passover lamb covered sin for a year, right? Because you had to do it next year to remind yourself next year. Jesus, according to John, was taking it away. It's not a year-by-year year thing anymore. Jesus came to get rid of it once and for all. Powerful statement. So John identifies for us the Lamb of God who is going to take away the sins of the world. That's number one. Number two, select the Lamb on the 10th day of the month. For 1,500 years, on the 10th day of Nisan, Jews had selected their lamb. They'd been looking at the flock. That's the one I got my eye on. I'm going to watch him for a while. But on the 10th day, I'm going to go and I'm going to select that lamb and take him home with me. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six, this is the end of the end of Jesus' life. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Passover celebration began on the 14th of Nisan, Right? Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany. Bethany is a suburb of Jerusalem. You could stand on a house in Bethany and throw a rock and hit the wall in Jerusalem. It's a really short walk. He arrived there at the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. So Passover begins on the 14th of Nisan. Jesus shows up at Bethany on the 9th of Nisan. The next day, according to John, which the day after the ninth would be the 10th. Can you go back a couple slides, Terry? Select the lamb on the, go back one more. Oh, on there, that's it. On the, go forward, sorry, Terry. On the 10th. So on the 10th day of Nisan, you were to select your lamb. The high priest, symbolically for everybody, would go to Jerusalem or to Beth, uh, Bethlehem, get the lamb, 
take it through the gates into Jerusalem and take it up to the temple, parade it through town for everybody to see on the 10th day. The next day, which was the 10th, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches. By the way, Josephus says there were a a million people in Jerusalem this year, 30 AD, to celebrate Passover. A large crowd of uh, Passover visitors took palm branches, went down to the road to meet Jesus, and they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. So next slide. Jesus entered Jerusalem, already have been declared, chosen as the Lamb of God, on the 10th day of the month, at the appointed time, for all lambs to be brought to Jerusalem for Passover. So you need to get the scene, okay? Not only is the high priest picked up his spot-free lamb and walked it through the gate into Jerusalem, but all of you men of the household have gone and bought a lamb, and you brought it into Jerusalem on the, on the 10th day, and that's the same day Jesus is walking into Jerusalem. Coincidence? Don't think so. It's the exact same day. Number three, observe, test the lamb for five days. It was the third instruction. For five days, according to Exodus 12, you choose the lamb on the 10th, you observe him for five days. So that's the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, the 14th. You observe the lamb for five days. Why? Why do you observe it for five days? Yeah, make sure there's nothing wrong with it. Make sure it's perfect. Make sure there's no blemish. Make sure it doesn't limp. Make sure it doesn't have any defect. It had to be perfect. So it had to be tested. The word is tested. It had to be tested for five days. Um, The custom was for the chosen lamb, the, the one that the high priest would choose, he would take it from Bethlehem to the temple, set it on the temple steps, and just let everybody who walked by test the lamb, observe the lamb. Here's what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> this, was, this was on the 10th when Jesus walked into the city. When he walked into the city, he returned to the temple. So he went where the chosen lamb would have gone to be displayed. And he began to teach. And the leading priests and elders all came up to him and they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? And if you continue to read Matthew For the next five days, Jesus is at the temple teaching, and for the next five days, these religious leaders ask him all kinds of hard questions, really difficult questions designed to trip him up, designed to make him say something that would get him in trouble, Uh, but he never does. In fact, for the next five days, all the Gospels record Jesus being tested and questioned by the religious authorities, but they could not discredit him in any way, and so they were frustrated. And out of desperation, they couldn't discredit him. Out of uh, desperation, they end up turning him over to the Roman leader in the city whose name was Pilate. And Pilate interrogates Jesus. John chapter 19. Pilate went out again and said to them, I've asked him all the questions. I've interrogated him. Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you can know I find no fault. The Roman governor just declared Jesus innocent. He's perfect. There's no fault in him. He is spotless. He is blemish-free. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, you take him and crucify him because I find no fault in him. So for five days, he was tested. The religious leaders couldn't trip him up. And the leader of the city says, he's perfect. There's no fault in him. So when I look at those three things to the day, Jesus fulfills the three elements that we've talked about so far. Pick a lamb, then get it on the 10th and bring it into Jerusalem, get ready to to be sacrificed, and then for five days, observe it. Jesus did all those three things on those three days. Do you see that in Scripture? Do you see it? The next one's really crazy. The next one's crazy. The fourth one is slaughter the lamb before twilight. Prepare the lamb at 9 a.m., kill the lamb at 3 p.m., make sure the lamb is consumed by 6 p.m. They had to roast it over a fire. Did you read that in Exodus 12? This is cool. I just read this yesterday. The the utensil that the Hebrews used for 1,500 years 
to roast the lamb. Do you know what it was? It was a spit. We would call it a spit. But they connected the lamb to the spit in a very unique and special way. The head had to stay on. The back legs were tied together like this. The front legs were stretched open like this. And you were on a spit that was in the shape of a capital T. Does this look familiar to anybody? Does this remind you of anything? Huh, interesting. 1,500 years. This is how lambs were, were consumed, roasted over the fire. Let's look at the timing of this, because now the timing is very specific, according to Scripture. The timing is, like, they didn't have watches like we had, so they kind of went by the location of the sun, but the timings were important because they had to get all these things done before 6 o'clock because that was the next day, and the next day was a Sabbath day. And so we couldn't do anything after 6 o'clock. So they had to get all these things done. And Mark, our boy Mark, who was recording Peter, uh, Mark wrote down Peter's experience. Mark chapter 15, here's what we learned. It was the third hour in Hebrew time, that's 9 a.m. Remember, Hebrew time starts at 6 p.m., uh, 6 p.m. That's the new day. The third hour is 9 a.m. when they crucified him. So the lamb was to be prepared to be slaughtered at 9 o'clock in your house. At 9 o'clock, Jesus is crucified. Not killed, but getting ready to die. At the exact hour when Jews were preparing their lambs for sacrifice, Jesus was nailed to a cross. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, the high priest has taken his lamb and he's washing it and he's cleaning it and he is preparing to slaughter it. You and your house, that's what you're doing. And that's the moment when Jesus is nailed to a cross, early in the morning, 9 a.m. When the sixth hour, that's noon, when the sixth hour came, darkness covered the whole land until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. And at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., which is when you, dad, or the high priest were cutting the throat of the lamb, at 3 p.m., the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then, 3 p.m., Jesus let out a loud cry and died. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw that he died in this way, this Roman centurion said, truly this man was the son of God. So at the exact hour that the Jews would kill their lambs and praise God for the sacrifice that was going to protect them one more year from death, Jesus gave up his life and died. So he was prepared at nine. He was killed at three just like the lamb that you would have sacrificed in your home or at the temple for your family. Historical specifics. Those four things, and then I'm going to give you one more thing. Select an unblemished lamb. John declared Jesus the lamb. Select the lamb on the 10th day of the month. That's when Jesus entered Jerusalem, just like all the other lambs that year that were going to be slaughtered. Observe and test the lamb for five days. Jesus was observed and tested for five days. Slaughter the lamb before twilight. That would have been before six o'clock. Um, and that's exactly what happened to Jesus, to the hour, those three events. Now, Jesus was taken off the cross before six o'clock because that was the new day. The high priest specifically asked the Romans to take him down because the would have been unholy for everybody. It was a problem. So they asked, uh, they asked the Romans to take him down, and he was before 6 o'clock. Um, the events surrounding the death of Jesus all line up exactly to the hour with the historical and prophetic observance of Passover. Bonus material. According to Exodus 12, the Passover lamb could not have any broken bones. Did you read that, Exodus 12? Make sure you don't break any of his bones. Really important. Crucifixion never killed anyone. Do you know that? You don't die from having nails put in your wrists and your ankles. You don't bleed to death. That's not how you die. The way you die on a cross is you suffocate. Because the way you're hanging, you have to push yourself up with your feet to catch a breath and then exhale. Push yourself up with your feet and exhale. And you could hang on the cross. People hung on a cross for days. 
You could hang on a cross and live for days, as long as you could push yourself up to breathe. So the way you hastened or quickened the death of a criminal on the cross, and this was common practice, was you would just break their shins. Because if you broke their shins, now they couldn't push up, and they would just hang there and suffocate. And the Jews asked the, high, or the, Jews asked the Romans, please take them all down before 6 o'clock so they would have hastened their deaths. And John says it was the day of preparation, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath because it was Passover week. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken, then their bodies would be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus because they were still alive. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. So not only did he fulfill all the requirements of the lamb to the day and hour, even his body was preserved. Nothing was broken in him, and it should have been. His bones should have been broken, but they weren't. Jesus fulfilled every qualification of the Passover lamb. And my question is, how did the Jews not see that? How did they miss that? It's easy for me to say, but how could they possibly have missed that? Questions? If they're just like everybody else that doesn't accept Jesus, they're still God's special people. Sure. There's not a spot for them in heaven unless Jesus is their Savior. But the cool thing is, not many people, nobody talks about this. Jews are coming to Jesus by the thousands. There are thousands of Messianic Jewish congregations all over the world. So it's not that all Jews have missed him. Orthodox Jews have missed him. Questions? Temple's gone. There's no, more, there's no more sacrificial system for the Jews. Not because they say Jesus was the sacrifice, but because they don't have a place to sacrifice. They don't have a temple anymore. Absolutely. Part of their plan is to take back the temple mount so they can rebuild the temple. In fact, that has to happen according to the book of Revelation. The temple has to be rebuilt. So someday it will be. But he was the ultimate sacrifice. Yes, he was. Because they don't, they don't see him as the sacrifice. They, they believe that if, and correct me if I'm wrong here on this one, they, they believe that the Messiah would come in in this roaring thunder adult person that's going to save the Jews. And he came in as a baby in a manger. And so it can't, that can't be him. Baby. You know. So, you know. They didn't accept it from day one. So how do they celebrate today? That is a really good question. Uh, they celebrate a Seder meal. They don't sacrifice a lamb, but they'll cook one and eat it. They do all of these things other than find a lamb and slaughter a lamb. But they eat one. They go to Walmart or Albertsons and buy a lamb. And, yeah. There's a very specific order that that meal is to be taken, and we've done a couple of them here. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see the order and the elements of that actual meal. The Last Supper that Jesus celebrated was a Passover meal a day early, but it was the Hebrew Passover meal. And there's some very specific things. And even in the meal, even in the elements that, that you eat, it all points to Jesus. Any other? Uh huh. You have a question about yeast? What would you like to know about yeast? Oh, I love that question. Throughout the Bible. It's, yeah, absolutely. So since you asked, go to the next slide, please, Terry. That's the perfect place for me to say. Next week, we're looking at... <laughs> that was perfect. Next week is the next feast, which happens to be the day after Passover. It's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or bread made without yeast. And it's actually a seven-day thing. Exodus 12 said it, don't eat yeast for seven days. Don't eat anything with yeast in it for seven days. So you might want to just check out Exodus 12 again, and we'll look at that next week, why, why it was such an important deal. All right? Cool? We're going to talk about it next week.
No, no spoilers. <laughs> Dusty, pray for us and we'll go home. <laughs>